Right. Good evening, everyone. I would like to call the April 13th, 2023 business meeting of the Croton Harmon Board of Education to order. And if we can all rise and join Ms. Akonzada's sixth grade class to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Born on born. Recommended action that the Board of Education. I'm sorry, before we pop into that, I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent <laughs> no, Walker no, no, so right. to bring us up to date on Miss A's right. class. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks so much to Miss A's class for that wonderful rendition of the pledge. And I'm happy to share a couple of notes from Miss A about some of the work that her sixth graders have been up to recently. They continue to focus on close reading, writing, and critical thinking skills in ELA. Uh, the Tigers are using a variety of text structures and genres to practice these skills. And in the upcoming weeks, the students will be reading plays from Scope Magazine, exploring mythology to enhance their understanding of their new read aloud, The Lightning Thief by Rick Reardon. In social studies, the students are currently immersed in their ancient Egypt unit. And throughout this unit, the Tiger students have been exploring the geography of Egypt and the impact that it has had on the growth of that ancient civilization. Students are also learning about the cultural developments while re all re also recognizing similarities, additional advancements, and achievements by the different ancient River Valley civilizations. Thank you so much again to Ms. A's class and outstanding work on the pledge and, and what they do in class every day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, recommended action that the Board of Education approves the agenda as presented. So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. All right. So now I'm very excited uh, to introduce uh, Mr. Louis Riolo from Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES uh, as we recognize Mia Ferrer as the student of distinction for April 2023. Mr. Riolo. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for having us here this evening. Uh, my name is Lou Riolo. I'm one of the assistant superintendents at DNW BOCES. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Walker, his leadership team, and their, their amazing talent, and we absolutely love working with them. Um, I'd like to thank the board, who we've worked closely with before. It was amazing. I said before, you know, I'm, I know I shouldn't be biased, but <laughs> one of my favorite places to come. It really is, and these are one of my, one of my most favorite things to actually do, the student distinction. So we have me here today, who is our new distinction, and she's your student and our student, and we're so very proud of her. Um, all of our accomplishments and everything else. Um, I'm going to introduce Mr. Stephen Lowry. He's our executive principal at the Tech Center, and he's going to introduce Mia, and some awards to give, introduce some staff. So, but once again, thank you so very, very much. Thank the greater Croton community for everything they do. And uh, I'll hand it over to Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Riola. And again, to echo the words of Mr. Riola, thank you guys so much for our shared student. She really is a superstar. So now it's our turn to embarrass her. <laughs> <laughs> so this might get a little uncomfortable. It might be swimming a little bit, but uh, me is a true superstar. Um, our new Visions Health program, which she is in, is an honors level program. And not everybody qualifies. It's pretty you know, stringent to get in. There's an interview process, an essay, and an overall like, character assessment. And, and Mia, from right out of the gate, was, was top of the list. And, she has not disappointed us at all. <laughs> She's a hard worker. Um, She's very respected by her peers. Part of our program, just for, for those that may not be aware of it, it's taught both at BOCES site and also at New Vis uh, Northern Westchester Hospital, which is Northwell, and also Hudson Valley Hospital, which is New York Presbyterian. It's hard to keep track of these <laughs> but but they get the shadow and they get to do real stuff so they're seeing you know real emergencies they're in the operating room they see you know births if they're lucky um but mia in particular is is very interested in ultrasound and she has the luxury of getting accepted not only to quinnipiac but also sacred heart as well so yeah she's she's really an all-star student um i know the staff at the hospital really enjoys her her classmates enjoy her, and she really adds a lot of value to our program. So if I had Mr. Walker come up, we're going to present Mia with not only a certificate, 
but also a medal of distinction as well. And you can see how much Mia's impact that both of her teachers uh, came out to support her as well. So Mia, on behalf of everybody here at Putnam Northern Westchester Boston's Tech Center and for Croton, we'd like to congratulate you for being the student of distinction for April of 2023. <laughs> I thought that was a surprise when you saw it. <laughs> 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 so yeah. No, it definitely does. So thank you. Thank you guys as well. Yeah, I do want to say on behalf of the entire board and administration, and really on behalf of the entire Croton Arms the community, we're so proud of you, your future. Just incredibly bright. Thank you for being you. Um, it's, an award. It's, it's our honor. And to your to your mom and your brothers as well. And yes. thanks so much to our colleagues uh, at Front Brother West. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Mia. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Thank you all for joining us. All right. Well, now I will move into uh, my presence report. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to those of us who are joining us in person. It was nice to be able to uh, celebrate with Mia and her family uh, in person after a couple of years of, of doing these uh, virtually. Um, and thank you to those are, who are joining us on live stream. Um, I hope everyone had a great spring break and holidays and the wonderful weather over the past couple of days has been a really great welcome to spring. Um, it's exciting to see that all of our spring sports are underway. Um, and speaking of, I'd like to take a moment to congratulate Cassie Kroos, who scored her 100th goal for the girls lacrosse program earlier this season. Uh, and as you know, uh, our meetings and work sessions over the last two months have been centered around discussion of our 2023-2024 budget, and you will hear again from administration this evening with an overview of the budget prior to the board vote to adopt it. You can find any information, presentations, and meeting videos related to the budget on the district website, and on May 4th, we will hold the public budget hearing. Please don't hesitate to send any questions related to the budget um, to the board or to budget.questions at chufsty.org. As a reminder, uh, candidate petitions for a Board of Education trustee must be submitted to the district clerk on or before 5 p.m. on Monday, April 17th. This year, you must have at least 38 valid signatures on a petition. Um, and also, I just want to remind everyone to please make your voice heard and come out and vote on Tuesday, May 16th from 9 a.m. to, no, nope. uh, sorry, from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, in the high school gym. Uh, you will hear from Superintendent Walker and our student member, Molly Levitt, uh, about many of the recent and upcoming events in the district. So I will just take them a moment to share some upcoming PTA events. Um, the At the high school, the PTSA will be kicking off a shoe collection fundraiser which coincides with spring cleaning and Earth Day. Uh, once the collection is completed, the shoes will be picked up by our partner, funds2orgs.com, and transferred back to their facility. Um, there they will be cleaned and packed and shipped to needed areas around the world. And the collection bin will be at the rear entrance of the high school for the next 30 days. Uh, over at PDC, uh, they will be having their next meeting on Monday, uh, April 17th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And they will be discussing their upcoming fundraising event, which will be taking place on Friday, April 21st at 7.30. And it's called The Journey from There to Here. And it's a moth-inspired evening of true stories from members of our community. Um, and that'll take place over at uh, the St. Augustine's Parish Center. Um, and then over at CET, uh, we will be excited to be welcoming back the Scholastic Book Fair um, from April 19th to the 21st. And that concludes my presence report. Um, and so now we will open up our first hearing of the public. Um, we ask that anyone who would like to address the board use the podium and state your name. You can um, give your email or contact information on the sign-up sheet provided. And please keep your comments to three minutes. Thank you. Um, whenever I am Truesdale Drive, I'd like to tell you about every month I go to Northern Virginia. And as you know, Northern Virginia is the focus of a parental uprising against woke ideology in the schools of the United States, specifically two counties, Fairfax County and Loudoun County, Virginia. These are two of the richest counties in the United States. 
they have the most educated population in the United States and they can't handle a school system properly. As you'll note, thankfully one member on this board prevent this, although this board would do this. 1,200 notifications of, na of national merit scholarship winnings were withheld from the students and their parents because they felt it was inequitable and unfair to minority students. They suggest that I go past these high schools, Fairfax High School, oh. um, Jefferson High School, West, Spring West Springfield High School, Robinson High School, go past these high schools. They want to abolish one of the best high schools in the United States, Thomas Jefferson High School, because enough of a certain ethnic group won't get in and too many of another ethnic group get in. 74% of that school were either Pakistani, Indian, or Chinese or Korean. And because other minority groups which they identified couldn't get in that school, they wanted to close the school down. Instead of closing the school, they had open enrollment, much like we screwed up the city school system, college system. 50 years ago. The temptation to create CRT, which as it, as the sign says, the guy that wrote the steps is CRT, under the guise of DEI, eliminating standardized tests, doing away with the SAT test. <clears throat> if a Chinese immigrant coming into San Francisco with two years background in the United States can do well on a damn SAT test or PSAT test, we can expect the students in the United States to do just as well. And if kids are deprived, as they have been by the union and, and, uh, and school administrators in other cities, if their school sucks so badly, then it's the obligation of the citizens of those districts, one, to reappoint a different school board, and two, provide like this district does do in the summer, remedial education for those kids that need help, not to lower the standards for everybody, but to raise the, the other kids up whether it be because of a language problem or because they were deficient in some particular uh, subject, math, science, English, or whatever, what have you. It's not to lower things down, it's to raise everybody up. <laughs> and unfortunately, the way of the United States is a simple way, and it's because of the teachers union nationally. I have nothing, I don't know about this teachers union but, and other places. Their thing is to bring everybody care down. Thank you. Thank you. I will now turn it over to Superintendent Walker for his report. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for everyone who's joining us both in person and remotely. Uh, as Sarah indicated earlier, I think there's a fair amount of overlap between her topics, mine and Molly's. So I'm going to aim for brevity and to cover most of those things that I think Molly's not going to talk about. So we'll let Molly's presentation carry the day as it should. Uh, but I wanted to start with uh, issuing a tiger welcome, as we always do, to two new members of the faculty and staff, beginning with Nicole Kelly, assistant principal at PVC. Uh, Nicole joined us from Chappaqua Schools, uh, and one of the things that she said to me not long ago when asked about what it is she enjoys about being part of this system that I think exemplifies uh, Nicole's energy and inspiration uh, was her line, I love everything about being uh, at PVC and about being in our school district. Uh, Nicole brings uh, phenomenal uh, and really well-developed leadership skills uh, and a terrific and positive problem-solving orientation to PVC every day uh, and has made an already outstanding school, in my opinion, even better. So uh, welcome, Nicole, and thank you for all that you do. A quick note about Nicole, when she's not at work, she enjoys hanging out with her family and her English bulldog, Named Sheldon. So welcome, Nicole. Also, we issue a tiger welcome, welcome to Peter Halligan, uh, third grade teacher at CET. Peter joins us from the Garden City <clears throat> Park School District. Uh, and when I had a chance to, to spend some time with him recently, one of the things that he shared with me that I was struck by was uh, he, how impressed he is by the collaborative nature of the work that happens here. And one of the things that he shared was, quote, Almost everything on my desk right now is an idea I've gotten from someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that really speaks to when we talk about a future-driven school system, we're talking about a lot of things, but one of those things is faculty members who are inclined toward collaboration, toward learning with and from each other. Uh, and Peter's mentality certainly exemplifies that. Uh, when he's not at work, an interesting thing about Peter is that he's taking acting classes. Uh, so perhaps we'll see him on an upcoming episode of Law and Order or some, <laughs> some other uh, uh, TV show, but 
Uh, welcome, Peter. Thanks so much for your contribution so far. We're thrilled to have you as part of Tiger. Wanted to make mention, uh, of course, of the outstanding, uh, this really delightful, fun, uh, terrific performance of Susical that uh, that the PVC student body led by Sally Barnes and Christina Carmesino put on. Uh, just terrific talent, uh, backed by really, really well directed uh, theatrics. And I have to tell you, it was uh, just one of the real pleasures of the past couple of months was to get a chance uh, to be a part of that. So certainly the future of uh, Tiger Musical Theater looks very, very bright. So congratulations and thank you to all of them for giving us that treat. I'm sure Molly's going to talk about this. I just wanted <laughs> to say it. Uh, there are those moments we, we talk about as, as leaders where we know that we're present for something that kids are likely going to have some memory of for the rest of their lives. And so uh, John and I looked at each other and Laura at that at some of those moments and we're like, you know, we we will remember this for a long time. But we hope very much that the kids remember some of these moments uh, when they're our age, uh, when they're much older. So thank you so much to Carrie Tracy, to Pam Morrison, uh, to all the faculty and staff, and certainly to the students who made this such a fun event. At some point when we have more time, I'll explain what's happening in the picture in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, but really, aside from maybe the most intense game of musical chairs since last year's Color Wars, uh, it was even intense to be a judge for something like that. So uh, really a great, great time, and I'll let Molly speak to that. So more, we also spent some time together as an entire faculty and staff on Superintendent's Conference Day on March 17th. And to me, that day uh, and the messaging of that day was really about possibility and about um, fellowship coming together uh, to think about, to envision what our schools can be in the future and the opportunities uh, that we look forward to providing for everyone who's a part of the system here. Uh, and it is rare when you get all or almost all of, of the entire team to get a chance to be together in the same place at the same time, laughing with each other, enjoying each other, learning with them from each other. Uh, so that was a, a special, special day for the entire school district communities, uh, faculty and staff. And so I thank uh, everyone who was a part of planning and implementing that day. I also wanted to make mention, uh, as we did on, on social media, that earlier this month we celebrated National Assistant Principals Week. Uh, between Mr. Maxim, Ms. Kelly, and Mr. Campanero, and we're incredibly blessed uh, in our schools to have three outstanding and truly, truly dedicated leaders. Uh, it's an honor to be their colleague, uh, and we thank them during that week and every week for what they do to make our school high schools so special. And as Sarah already mentioned, the CET Book Fair, we look forward to that. I understand that there's going to be a moment prior to the start where uh, Mrs. Bianchi and Mr. Campanero are going to be camping out on the roof of the building. So okay, nice. I will uh, share more information with that uh, with, with the board. I personally look forward to being there to see that happen. <laughs> also, I believe Molly's going to speak about this, but wanted to make mention of just how incredibly impressed uh, I was with the talent, the vision, the skill uh, of all of our uh, Tiger students, our artists. Uh, led by Jody Berger and the entire art department, the AP art show was, again, just knocks your socks off with how uh, impressive the product is that uh, that's coming out of our students here. So I uh, always want to make sure that we get a chance as a community to come together and celebrate the outstanding creativity <laughs> of our young artists. And so that was a wonderful opportunity to do that. Now, Sarah also mentioned the start of spring sports. Congratulations, yes, to Cassidy. Thanks to DJ, to the coaches, the Booster Club. Also want to give a shout out to our athletic trainer, Andrea Zambrano, uh, who all have been part of making this a very successful start to the spring sports season. And since we're already, I guess, it's summer weather, uh, it should hopefully uh, be a very uh, successful outdoor season for all of our spring sports teams. And I'm always going to talk about this as well. I will just say uh, I had... A great opportunity to spend some time with uh, our uh, visitors from La Rochelle in France, uh, arranged by uh, Dr. Bree and Allison Rhodes. Thank you to both of them, along with the faculty from their school in France. And so I got a chance to spend some time with them the other morning and was talking to a couple of the students about music. I'm just curious about what it was that they were listening to as as 16 year olds, uh, 17 year olds in France. And so I was expecting to hear Taylor Swift, which I did. But then a couple of the young ladies I was standing next to wanted to talk about David Bowie. And I thought that was, I was like, wow, oh, David Bowie is still appreciated by 
by young people uh, in Europe and I guess everywhere. So that was kind of a, an interesting moment. I will say that they also uh, engaged in a uh, scavenger hunt around Croton, and I was uh, honored, as was uh, Penelope, that one of the things that the group had to do was to come to the district office and to learn who Penelope was and get a, and see a picture of Penelope. So um, Penelope, thanks, uh, Dr. Bree and, and Ms. Robes for that opportunity as well. And just wanted to uh, also make mention to, sometimes I get a chance to talk about events and sometimes it's just moments. And this was one that struck me, Dr. Blair and I got the chance to, to visit, uh, we were invited to visit uh, Ms. Capone and Ms. Valentino's kindergarten class recently. They wanted to show us something they were working on. And while I was there, uh, I was struck by this example of when we say vibrant, engaging, comfortable, supportive learning environments, I'm not sure it gets any more poignant than that uh, to really comfortable uh, young kindergarten students working on uh, some early literacy skills while obviously um, kicking back and uh, enjoying a, a really just incredibly beautiful and vibrant classroom space. So thank you to, to those teachers for putting that together. I believe that is it for me. Thank you as always. Thank you very much. And we'll turn it over to Molly Lovett for her report. Hi. Um, as Mr. Walker mentioned a lot, I have <laughs> um, yeah, a lot has gone on since I'm going to go through a lot of things, um, starting off with Spirit Week and the pep rally the week of March 27. So the Friday right before break, we had our pep rally. Um, each grade had a color and we competed for points all week. We had things like everything but a backpack day. We had um, musical chairs, which is always really fun to watch. Um, the weird picture in the upper right corner was Penny that was bowling and it it doesn't get any less weird than what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> the sophomores won, and the seniors looked like second. So, uh, yeah, also the AP art show, that was Tuesday, March 28th. Um, everything was amazing. I, I went just to support my one friend, and I ended up really looking at every single person's um, exhibit. And, yeah, you could just really tell that everyone put a lot of care into everything. Uh, yeah, and the French exchange students from here are here from La Rochelle. I actually have one myself. They got here on April 7th, and they're staying for two weeks. Um, yeah, they've been running all over Croton and Manhattan. So, yeah, if you were wondering why there were, like, 20 French kids at the cross game on Tuesday, that was them. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the first time the program has been run since COVID, so we're really happy to have them. And tomorrow they're going to the junior prom. Uh, yeah, also at CHHS, the fourth quarter began on Monday, April 10th, and I believe the report, the quarter three report cards are published tomorrow. I'm not sure about that, though. Uh, yeah, and as I mentioned, uh, the junior prom is tomorrow, April 14th, and I think the bus gets here at 5 30. Um, the National Honor Society induction ceremony is taking place on Monday, April 17th at 5 p.m. Uh, seniors in NHS will be personally introducing the new juniors being inducted. And will be great event, and families are encouraged to attend. Um, the CHH Spring Drama, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, performs on Friday, April 21st, and Saturday, April 22nd. Uh, yeah, we keep choosing shows with really long names. Also, <laughs> the, and also, the CHHS Spring Concert is right around the corner on Wednesday, April 26th at 7 p.m. And finally, I'm just going to go into a couple more events that are going on in, here and in the community. So Student Activism Club is holding its annual Take Back the Night March on Thursday, April 27th at 6.30 to raise awareness against sexual assault and domestic violence. Um, there will be several speakers, including CHHS students and an alum. Um, there's also going to be a gift card drive going on to help victims of domestic violence gain financial independence. Everything raised goes to My Sister's Place, which is a local um, shelter and a capable alert was sent out about it, and we'll be sending out more emails and reminders in the coming two weeks. Uh, yeah, the march will start at Five Corners, and we hope that um, many members of the community will be able to attend. Also, Holocaust Remembrance Week is the week of April 24th. Uh, several student clubs are planning activities for that week. On Tuesday, April 25th, Annie Kleinhaus, a Holocaust survivor, is going to be speaking to the entire CHHS student body. And that will be followed by a lunch where a small group of students and teachers will get to have a more informal conversation with Ms. Pinehouse. Uh, yeah, and then following the Take Back the Night March, that Thursday, April 27th, uh, in the CHHS Auditorium, the school is going to be hosting an exhibit from the Holocaust Education Center in White Plains called 13 Driver's Licenses, telling the individual stories of Jewish citizens persecuted in Germany during the Holocaust. 
Um, and this event will be open to the entire community. And more information on that is going to be sent out via K-12 alert soon. Uh, yeah, and finally, um, that will. For any current CHHS juniors who are interested in being the student ex officio member next year, um, if you have any questions, I'd love to talk. So email me and I'll be holding some sort of information. I'll be sending out stuff soon. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Molly. All right, we will now move into new business. Uh, recommended action. Um, actually, before I read the action, do you want to, did you want to take it over for a review of the budget and those budget <clears throat> Sure. So before we uh, move to adopt the budget, we'll hear again from uh, Ms. Harrington Cohen. Okay. Thanks, Emily. So, right. things, okay. I'll turn it over to Denise. Yeah. I never want to miss an opportunity to talk about something as important as the budget, and in my mind, particularly this one, I think this is um, a transformative budget for the system, uh, and I'm always happy to talk about uh, the opportunities that this budget provides not only for us to get incrementally better at what we already do as a system, but to truly think about how we can enhance the entire system through what it is new that we're able to to bring to bear for students and for faculty and staff through the budget. So I wanted to begin this by uh, talking a little bit about the vision behind that. Uh, we know, and I think one of the things I feel best about in terms of the process this year is that for everyone who's been following along in the community has genuinely been a process. Right? Been six or seven uh, public opportunities for discussion uh, and investment in thinking around the budget. Uh, the budget development is really budget development is uh, a year-long enterprise. And frankly, it starts even before last year, last year, the prior year's budget gets approved. And that happens through conversations in classrooms, in hallways, in the community. Uh, in administrative meetings, in board meetings, about the vision for the system, about what we want to be able to provide for students uh, to be responsive to this moment uh, that we're in and the moments to follow. Uh, I think the process hopefully has been one that has allowed the community to see the trajectory of that. And we look forward to hearing their input on the product on May 16th. As I said earlier, one of the things that we talk about is, and I say this every time I talk about the budget, is that a budget is not simply a function of dollars and cents, but it's a representation of vision and of values within the system. Uh, and so what we're looking to do, and I know that the board knows this well, is with the work of the strategic plan, with the development of, of an updated vision statement through a lot of the work that's been happening over years and years, is to think about how we make the entire system better for everyone who's in. Uh, so that everyone, every person who's a part of the system feels inspired by what happens in schools, feels connected to it, feels a sense of belonging in it, feels passionate about what is happening within our system. And to do some of that, we have to confront some of the structural barriers that have traditionally caused almost every system to not feel that way for, for kids uh, and for the adults in it. And so it's an opportunity for us through the budget to figure out how we can create opportunities that are responsive to this moment and to this vision. And I, I feel great uh, from my seat as the superintendent that we've been able to do that. Uh, and when we talk about not just incremental improvement, but systemic enhancement, uh, these are some of the examples of how this budget does that. Uh, the physics teacher, not because we may necessarily just need additional sections, right? That's incrementally improving what we already do, but a physics teacher that then allows for the creation and implementation of interdisciplinary coursework where students genuinely learn the way that we learn in the real world, right? Not in silos, but in opportunities to integrate math uh, and physics and other sciences and engineering in one place over the course of multiple periods with multiple teachers to earn multiple core credits. That kind of transformative opportunity is something that comes as a result of this budget. The art teacher at PVC doesn't just simply allow us to add more sections of, of some art program that we're already doing, as important as that is, but it allows us to enable all students in the building to demonstrate creativity, curiosity, and inspiration through access to the Indie Lab. The instructional coach at CET is designed to lift every faculty member and through them, every student, through peer-to-peer -peer feedback and collaboration in developing new and, and innovative learning experiences. The music teacher 
at PVCL is going to allow all student mus musicians in grades eight through 12 to receive regular scheduled small group instrumental music instruction. And through doing that, we'll lift the entire program, the product of what it is that gets a chance to be shared with the community, as well as general music instruction for all students in grades five through eight. Uh, as we know, one of the guiding questions uh, that we've been working through this year has been about how we're able to connect with uh, and help to, to support members of our school district community whose first uh, native language is not English. And so the school community liaison position is a direct response to that. We'll serve as a connector and a support for our Spanish speaking students and families, ensuring that when we talk about equity, that every member of the school district community is able to access the full range of opportunities within our district. And as we talked previously, one of the critical aspects of long-term success and sustainability in our system is to allow for <laughs> leadership development and sustainability within our business office. And so that assistant business manager position within the budget allows us to do that as well. So uh, we recognize what an incredible opportunity this is through this budget to not just take small steps, but to genuinely make huge leaps forward in terms of how we continue to enhance the system here. And I'm incredibly proud to recommend it to the board. Uh, and so with that kind of as a backdrop in terms of vision and values, uh, now Denise gets to do the fun part, which is to talk about <laughs> the finances, the dollars and the cents. Denise? Thank you, Susan Kevin Walker. So we'll begin with the New York State budget, which has been delayed again. <clears throat> And as you know, many components of our planning are contingent on the state budget. And I will say, I just read an article this morning that um, Controller of Denapoli is really pushing, um, indicating that you know much of what we do is contingent on that. So uh, quit the horse trading and get the budget done. <laughs> So evidently it's being held up on bail and uh, bail legislation and new housing. Um, but so let's just take a look at uh, what we believe is true today. Uh, at least until Monday the 17th, uh, we will most likely not hear before then. And uh, word is we may not hear until a week or so after that. But according to budget and state aid runs, they indicate that um, all are in support of full restoration of foundation aid, uh, with this giving Croton Harmon an overall increase of approximately 28%. Uh, percent. We are also looking at additional funding for universal pre-K. Uh, we've been slated to receive an additional 25 spots for youth pre-K. Uh, we were one of the first adopters uh, in the program once it was established uh, on a broader scale uh, two years ago. Uh, the one house budgets are in support of the following items and in um, actually in opposition to what was recommended by Governor Hochul. Uh, so they are recommending universal free meals for all students, relief for uh, maintenance costs. So all of our uh, special education students that are placed in residential placement. The district is responsible for the tuition for that residential placement and then also for 60% of a maintenance cost that is paid to the county for that placement. Uh, that was increased uh, by about 20% several years back. So they are uh, advocating to uh, release that burden in one way or another. Uh, also plan to revise the foundation aid formula based on its, uh, you know, its age and uh, archaic look back. Also, the removal of some unfunded mandates and the reporting requirements for transparency, zero emission, et cetera. There we go. So next, we're going to take a look at our revenue sources. So this is the allowable tax levy. Uh, we'll begin with this. This is a prescribed formula by the New York State Controller's Office, one that many of us are familiar with. Uh, the tax cap uh, it was established about ten years ago as a means to as a means to cap growth on um, tax levies and school budgets. Uh, it was made permanent in 2020. So I'll take you through this very quickly. I, I know this is not everyone's favorite slide, um, and it is condensed. I've taken a lot out. 
but essentially we look at the prior year tax levy, we multiply it by the tax base growth factor. So that's um, a figure that's uh, given to us by Office of Real Property and Taxes. It's the brick and mortar growth within our community. So um, we're looking at a 1.0039% uh, growth that expect that number to change significant, significantly in the upcoming years with developments within the community, um, which brings us to our um, <coughs> prior year adjusted tax levy. We take that figure, then multiply it by the growth factor, which is CPI or 2%, the lower of the two, for C CPI uh, established for school districts was 8%. Uh, we did not, of course, get the 8%. It's capped at 2%. Uh, then we take from that uh, any pilots. The district does not have any pilots in the works right now, according to the village. Uh, for next year, so that is also zero, and then the capital tax levy exclusion, which is uh, is a calculation which uh, encompasses debt service and state aid, so that is removed from that. So we are looking at a proposed tax levy of two point six four percent. This is uh, lower than our initial projection, which was I believe two point six nine um, earlier this year, uh, based on our. Uh, state aid uh, projections. So this is uh, kind of a look at the tax rates and tax histories for our two communities. So we have about 4% of our uh, residents in Yorktown and the remaining is in Portland. As you can see with Yorktown, it's very extreme way in uh, tax rate, that's due primarily to the fact that it's a small number of properties. There's also the, um, the um, equalization. Yes, rate. thank you. The <laughs> equalization rates are significantly different in both of those communities, uh, where Portland's as our tax rate is fairly level. It uh, varies significantly in both of those communities. So let's take a look at our state aid projections. So as you can see, foundation aid is the most significant aid increase uh, at $1.825 million. That represents actually an increase of over 52%. Uh, that is a function one of the full restoration of foundation aid, uh, and this is uh, the year that we will be made whole. Um, but in addition to that, the other primary drivers of foundation aid are actual district wealth, um, which is determined by adjusted gross income, uh, and then actual valuation of our property. Those two combined with pupil counts will impact the increase or decrease of foundation aid. All of those factors in Croton Harmon's case for this year have been positive and gone up, therefore uh, affording us an additional uh, percentage of foundation aid. Uh, another factor is uh, the two largest are transportation aid and BOCES aid. Both, both of those aids are expense-based aids, therefore they are not contingent on pupils or tax evaluations. They are solely based on expense. Uh, I will tell you that I would like to give a lot of credit to our treasurer, uh, Barry Gamson, who is um, an aid monger, and he is always looking to increase our aid, and he worked very closely with me and Joe to look at our expenses and to complete our state aid reports to ideally maximize our aid um, in those two categories. And he was successful. And he even got uh, some additional aid in our software library and tech, which is a little bit less significant, but he's still counting it in, in his cabinet. <laughs> Even longer, let me start calling it that. <laughs> more aid, I hear his office going more aid. Uh, okay, so this is a look at our projected reserves. So there is an increase uh, from 22, 23, as you will see, 
However, this number is going to decrease substantially after our audit and come July. So our capital reserves, which include our 2013 reserve, 16, and then also our transportation uh, vehicle reserve, that is going to go down uh, approximately $3 million at the beginning of the year because we will be uh, expending capital reserves for uh, the drainage work that has begun on the 2013 project. We also have a small component of our 2018 capital work, which uh, was in reserves that will be uh, utilized as well. And then of course we have the uh, future facilities plan, which has allocated 2.5 million of that reserve. And then we have the transportation vehicle capital reserve where we will be expending money. Providing the proposition passes, we will be um, expending some of those funds for our uh, third electric school bus. So this is, is a projected number and it has to be projected as of June 30th. So it does not reflect uh, some of the significant changes that will occur. Uh, so here we go with just an overall look at our reserves, um, at our revenue. So county and sales tax and interest earnings that you will see are up significantly. Um, that is due primarily to the interest rates um, and spending within the county. We have, even though it's up significantly, we have very conservatively projected. I do not expect the interest rates uh, will be what they are today. So the interest earnings on all of our accounts, uh, we expect to go down, but still uh, it's a significant increase, even with that conservative estimate. Uh, next, we have state aid, which has gone up 2.16 million. Uh, another component of our revenue is the appropriated fund balance that the districts puts forward to balance the budget every year. And that is uh, that is going down about 250,000, which is positive because that is not a sustainable source of revenue for, for our budgets. Um, so that is going down in a positive way. Um, and then of course we have the allowable tax levy at 1.1 uh, million bringing a total change in revenue to about 3.5 million. So not getting too deep in the weeds, um, I will say that our budget and our budget codes align with the controller's recommendations. And we have four components. So we have the program, which the program component um, the uh, function component looks at departments. So our function component of our budget code, which is the look that you have here as far as how we're slicing the budget, looks at departments. So it looks at uh, pupil personnel services, technology, um, transportation, et cetera. Then we have the object component, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment. So this is our budget overview by function. Uh, general support, which is the first function, represents 14% of our budget. As you can see, that is up significantly, it's like about 11.8%. Uh, this is due primarily to operations and maintenance. So, th so that department is susceptible to inflation like no other department. We're talking about supplies, materials, maintenance, and services for all of our grounds, um, equipment, et cetera. Uh, then also we have uh, projected utility increases uh, from kind of said upward of 18 to 20 percent. Those are incorporated into that. Um, then we have staffing salaries, of course, and then BOCES, admin, and capital budgets are also up. And those uh, we will be voting on next week. The BOCES capital and admin bus budget will be voting on next week. The uh, next component is instruction. And that's up about 5.9% and is primarily due to staffing, salary increases, contractual agreements, et cetera. Pupil transportation up about 7.9%. That's due primarily to utilities, 
and fuel and staffing. And then we have uh, finally employee benefits and debt service. So our employee benefits includes our uh, increases to teacher retirement system, the employee retirement system, contributions to social security for all of our staff, and then um, health, dental, and other related benefits. And then there's an increase in debt service that was uh, anticipated based on our debt service schedule related to our 2018 bonding uh, of our capital project and um, our anticipated band costs for the future facilities as well. So here we, here we have it by object. So object looks at spending categories, salaries, benefits, supplies, materials, contractual services, et cetera. As you can see uh, from the chart to the right, salaries represent 52% of our budget and benefits over 20%. Uh, contractual supplies and others, that's 16%. Debt service, 8%. And then uh, supplies, uh, about 3% the total increase to the budget, uh, just to show it in a different way, about 77% is related to uh, salaries and benefits, and about 12% related to utilities, debt service, and BOCI services. So some of the budget drivers, as discussed uh, on the revenue side, certainly the full restoration of foundation aid and increases to our pupil accounts and property and uh, assessment wealth, uh, increases to county sales tax and increases to interest earnings are primary drivers there. Uh, our expense budget, salaries and increased staffing, benefit costs, uh, utility increases and costs to uh, operate our buildings, uh, the impact of inflation on costs of goods and services, and then also uh, the absorption of some of the uh, spending that was absorbed by our COVID brands. So R and ESSER and uh, CRISA. So those grants are ending. So we will be absorbing those costs into the general fund. Okay, on the ballot. So uh, the uh, one proposition that we will have on the ballot for this year is for uh, the purchase of vehicles for uh, transportation and district needs. We are recommending the purchase of one 66 passenger electric school bus, along with an additional $25,000 for potential infrastructure charging and improvements. Uh, that's valued at about $471,000. That will be funded from our newly established vehicle, uh, aka <clears throat> transportation reserve. Uh, next, we have 124 to 30 passenger ICE vehicle. Recommend ICE stands <clears throat> for internal combustion engine vehicle. Uh, recommended uh, at a cost of, this is an uh, all wheel drive vehicle. Um, I'm sorry, my, my apologies, that it's not an all-wheel drive, um, at 98,000. Uh, then we have a one, uh, then we have one seven-passenger plug-in hybrid SUV, that's an all-wheel drive vehicle, estimated at a maximum cost of uh, 75,900. Uh, that will be funded also from current appropriations. And then we have two low-speed utility vehicles, uh, that will be uh, electric as well and utilized for grounds maintenance, map to manage events, trainer supports for our um, athletes uh, and individual students, school-wide events, et cetera, to help transport families and uh, students uh, throughout the campus and also for <clears throat> grounds maintenance. Um, all of these this whole proposition and all of these expenses will be funded solely through reserves and current year appropriations, uh, therefore not requiring any debt on behalf of the district and not uh, imposing any additional taxes for our residents. 
which is a very good time for that because uh, inflation is really mm -hmm. increasing the borrowing rate substantially. So we will not need to borrow uh, for any of these costs. And, and this will be the first time that the district has ever done that. Uh, generally, we issue bans. Not, not first time. Not the first time. No. Back until about 2003, the district oh. purchased all vehicles through current appropriation. Through the uh, operating through budget. Through the operating budget. Okay. And then the board, at the time, decided to move it into um, <clears throat> bands and, and to stabilize mm -hmm. the, the tax rate. Yeah. Stand correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, okay. Got my little. So if approved, no borrowing debt would be required and, and therefore no impact of taxes. So on the ballot, so we have proposition one, which is our budget for uh, 56174983 Then we have our vehicle proposition uh, number two. Our proposition number three is for the library budget. And uh, Jesse from the library will be uh, joining us at the public budget hearing next month uh, to present the library budget. And then lastly, we have trustee elections. Please remember to vote on May 16th at CHHS from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, just some upcoming dates. On May 4th, we have our public budget hearing. And then again, on May 16th, the annual vote. Always uh, check us out online. Uh, you can reach me directly at budget questions, budget.questions at chupsd.org. Uh, there's a Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter account. And uh, Greg is updating our website regularly with uh, budget updates and uh, presentations. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions for Denise? Where we? Yeah. Also, we will be. Uh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Yep. We're also going to be approving the pop property tax report card. This yes, evening. we will be. Re yep. Right after. And this. that's a, a legal requirement, and we will need to um, post that to the state education department first thing tomorrow morning to comply with that. So one question. Yes. What did we end up with regard to the? <clears throat> TRS and ERS. TRS. Oh, Neil, I need to ask a question. I didn't have my own copy. I thought you memorized that one. So ERS is up um, and TRS is down. However, TRS represents 75 to 80% of our salaries. Um, there's numbers here. So TRS, uh, well, I don't think it's been finalized yet, Neil, actually. Um, they're expecting about 10%. And then ERS uh, will increase from 11.6 to 13.1%. So the other question I have, just in looking at the allowable tax levy, um, page nine. We know that next year, or well, we are almost certain that next year, there will be a pilot, mm -hmm. which will be first year seventy thousand dollars, and then year after seventy thousand plus three percent, three percent, three percent each year. So looking at this, what that because considering next year. If I understand this correctly, that would decrease, reduce, yeah, reduce yeah. our tax levy by that 70, our allowable tax levy by 70,000. And then thereafter, it will basically would be a, pretty much be a wash. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned that the tax base growth factor included in that is the um, I'll call it the wealth of the community. Like that's one of the factors that goes no, no, it's actually brick and mortar development within the community. Okay, so so it's growth, growth. It's 
property so, growth. So we 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 will have that project, the affordable housing project, which will have the pilot, and conceivably at least one other project in within the district at um on North Riverside. So that would then affect would would probably affect positively our tax base growth factor. Possibly, depending uh, upon the timing, because right. there is a considerable okay. lag. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that kind of, that's how those things work, if not in tandem, you know, work somehow. And then, of course, we may have more uh, capital, you know, we have changes in the capital um, um, tax levy exclusion on both sides of the equation. I'm just Right, and, and that's that's a really good point because the 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 good news is is that next year because of the capital project and the short term borrowing associated with that, we can project to either um, to offset any changes by borrowing less and supporting that through the reserve. So we have. Um, we have the latitude to determine when we're going to utilize the reserves and when we're not. So we can we can leverage both of those factors to offset any um, negative impacts. Because there is one other negative impact, if you will, that I see for 24-25, which is that while we have a major set of quite 50% increase in our foundation, that's the catch up. So next year, we will not, we cannot anticipate more or much more than the 5.2 million. That is yeah, how the foundation formula. aid on page 11. Yes, correct. So, so that, so we, we will be stabilized at that rate. Mm -hmm. So that rate that rate will remain, but we're not going to be seeing considerable right. increase. Right. I, I'm just thinking yeah. as we have a lot of initiatives as and new new things as superintendent um spoke about at the beginning, we know that 2425 we won't be able, given what we see here, to do a lot of the things and not of new things beyond the things that we're talking about for this year. I think that's probably the case. The quantity okay. of new things, possibly, mm -hmm. but but certainly maintaining. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Good. And adding value to that, yes. Josh? Uh, concerning the pilots, were yeah. we able to get any sort of concession concerning these pilots from the village? In terms of you know, basically the pilot is the same. It, it, in a sense, it reduces the tax levy, right? Um, uh, but we have no control over it. It's agreed by the by the village. And uh, are they pocketing the entire lump? Well, they are pocketing, if you will, the entire lump. And there, there are some. Nuances in the final um, provision, which I have had some questions about, and I raised those questions on behalf of the board last year with the village. Didn't get any fractional movement because we really have no no leverage at this point, given the state of the law, to be able yes. to be even at the table. Mm -hmm. So they negotiated the pilot arrangement with the developer before even speaking to us about that amount that has been allocated to us in the pilot agreement. And the pilot is basically one where for the 25 year police uh, term, of that pilot, there is no change that will be made. It doesn't matter about what the um, percentage increase in inflation or anything else will be. We have got what we have got: seventy thousand year one, seventy thousand 
three percent year two, seventy thousand another three percent on top of that, on top of that, on mm -hmm. top of that. And that's all there is. There's another component which raised or I raised the question about, but didn't go anywhere, which is in addition, there is a payment that the developer will make of twenty thousand dollars a year to the village, which is really a payment in lieu of taxes. But they're going to get that twenty thousand. It doesn't go into our our percentage or our portion, and it's really, it is a payment in lieu of taxes because it's part of this agreement. It is ostensibly for the provision of certain. I guess services that the village is supposedly going to provide user fees, but it's really not defined. And whatever question we might have as to whether our portion should be twenty thousand plus seventy thousand plus, because we should get part of that twenty thousand, the village has said. So we should get part. Of, we will get part of the seventy. Yes. We will. We'll get the seventy. Yeah. Yes. Right. right. We'll, we'll get, get the seventy. Right. What we won't get is. Any part of that, Any part 20, of that twenty, okay. which you know is really we should get part of it. I think, but it well, we will have plenty of time to discuss it when the pilot is actually yes. coming next and year. When that happens, I'm very <laughs> I don't want to confuse people into there. There is no pilot this year. It is there is nothing on me. <laughs> I, I I I'm with you on that. I'm, I'm thinking about the this year and next. But let's move on with this year. <laughs> right. And that is a, a statewide dilemma, also. It's not a, a Croton dilemma. Right. It's you don't about, about, about the, 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 the tax, tax about the pilots right. yeah. and our, our lack of um, ability to impact those decisions. And that, and that is something that when we, I believe, when we spoke to legislators at our mm -hmm. local forum, mm -hmm. we mentioned that part of what we were mm -hmm. looking for is to have a better. See the table. Yeah, yeah. And also the laws case. have been changed recently, if I remember correctly, to at least provide us with notice when a pilot is going, you know, is being done. You know, it used to be back at uh, Symphony Knoll. We didn't even find out about it until after Symphony Knoll was signed, sealed, delivered, and they started to build. And we got nothing out of the Symphony Knoll mm -hmm. project in terms of pilot payment. Well, the village has been very open with us. Yep. We have strong relationships yep. with them, and um, yep. Brian is, is continually updating me. Symphony Knoll was in 12 years ago, so yep. there's a different relationship at that time. Okay. Well, if we have no other questions, uh, then recommend an action that the Board of Education adopts the 2023 2024. Croton Harmon Union Free School District budget in the amount of $56,174,983. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. And now we will move into the property tax report card. Recommended action that the Board of Education approves the 2023-2024 property tax report card for the Croton Harmon Union Free School District as presented. So second. First of all, on the I question. Apologize. I apologize for this awful looking document, but it's, <laughs> it's the only way that SED will print it out. <laughs> And it, essentially, this is uh, our, this is supposed to be our best estimate and projection. It's a budget to budget comparison, enrollment comparison, and also fund balance and reserve comparison. Um, question? Yeah. So it should be the schedule of reserve funds? Yes. Um, should that be the same as what the ending anticipated ending balance for twenty three? So, are you talking about the ending, the ending balance? If you can pull down a little bit. Yes, ending estimated balance six thirty twenty three. Yes. So there have been um, there's no ending balance on this. You're talking about you have to go up if you can go. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking you're moving it. <laughs> uh, can you go up a little bit more? 
thread floor. Yeah, so there, there will be a slight variation in there because in that figure, we incorporated interest. Mm. So interest for this year is over $500,000 on those reserves. So we, uh, we projected in, in interest in there where on this report that was established last week, we didn't incorporate any interest values. Okay. And their estimates, of course, we <laughs> won't know until probably our financials are complete. Yeah, to save some of the budget. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. All right. We will now move into policies for first reading. Um, the we have. Uh, <laughs> Policy uh, 4321.12, uh, policy 4321.12R, uh, 8121.1, and 8121.1R. Um, so these are available for first reading. Neil, did you want to give us a sure. brief overview? Brief overview. There are two separate subjects here, 4321.12 and 4321.12R. Deal with the um, use of timeout rooms and um, physical or mechanical restraints and aversives in uh, which may be um, within a child's individual education program, IEP. Um, the district does not use adversives. In fact, it is not um, permitted to use adversives uh, by operation of state regulation. Adversives are like withholding food, um, mm -hmm. you know, things that are pretty serious, and that's kind of hmm? yeah, okay. yeah. And so we we can't do it by law, and it's just a creation. I think um, uh, you know, an updating, and there's some updating here. Otherwise, to address uh, issues that are in the state regulations. Um, and we don't generally use timeout rooms often, according to um, Director of Pupil Personnel Services, or physical restraints, mechanical restraints. Um, but um, we have a policy. In fact, years ago, we did not have such a policy because we didn't do any of this. And we were told you still have to have a policy, even if you never do it. Um, this, this policy has been reviewed and the regulation reviewed and approved um, by the Director of Youth Personnel Services. The other policy, which is also an update, deals with opioid overdose prevention. We had a policy that pursuant to um, pursuant to a program run through the Department of Health, we have um, staff members who are trained volunteers who are trained responders who are able to administer by their training um, uh, okay. um, Narcan, Naxone, Naloxone, however you pronounce that. Right. Um, we, the policy that was in place, question was raised to me about, what about when I met with the director of human personnel services, what about our school nurses? Uh, school nurses also are trained and are and have the um, authority under state regulations to administer Narcan. So we have um, that uh, those changes in this policy. We also have changes. Uh, we also note rather that now Narcan can be purchased over the counter, and so there may be a lot of other people. Who will be able to respond because they are carrying Narcan? One of the things that the trained personnel have is under the Good Samaritan law, have protection as long as they are administering Narcan in good faith. Um, once again, this, this has been reviewed by the Director of Personnel Services. And so those are the changes that the policy committee is recommending. Now, if anybody has any questions as they go through the review of these or any uh, changes, just refer them to the policy committee and we will see these back 
um, next month for second range. Um, so one thing I will ask the policy committee is meeting on the 18th. Uh, if anyone who has any questions can get them to us by the 18th, preferably. Just hold any questions for now, save them for an email. Yeah. And that we you know, and you send that, and obviously things that need to be um, uh, spoken about with nursing personnel or the school mm -hmm. physician or director people themselves, or just go do that. Okay. All right. Um, and I have a couple of you. Mm -hmm. um, and now we'll move on to uh, 3.4 recommended action that the Board of Education approves the side letter of agreement between the Croton Harmon Union Free School District and the Aides of Croton United ACU bargaining unit as presented. So moved. Second. On the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Uh, recommended action that the Board of Education approves the bid award for district wide storm drainage improvements to Bradhurst Site Construction Corp. The total contract being re recommended, inclusive of any allowances, is $1,031,300. So Is that Omar? Yep. Okay. You get a second? Second. On the question, all in favor? Oh, oh sorry. Um, there is a handwritten page in this contract. And to be honest, uh, it's not terribly legible. Page uh, nine. Wait, look at that. Is there, I just wanted to just verify with the business office that this is that there's nothing material here. Um, or is this just a, a sheet of notes that ended up being <laughs> together with the yeah, uh, that must have been on the back of the, the bid proposal? Sorry. Yes, okay, so that is that is not actually part of no, the contract, no, no. no and that's no. actually looks like meeting notes, mm -hmm. yeah, that um, of kind of or interview notes of a contract or probably this contract, mm -hmm. um, which quite frankly, that is 30 page document he had, uh, is not, not for the public. It doesn't appear to be critically um, confidential, but- well, We should probably just read that page. Yeah, we'll yeah. read we'll it. We'll do it, thank you, Josh. Yeah, this was uh, this bid opening was held several weeks ago, but we had some issues <laughs> that the low bidder had to drop out of the um, the bidding. Mm -hmm. So then, and then we had uh, second and third that were very close, um, and there were some insurance issues around it. So uh, we had to uh, rectify those before actually awarding uh, the bid to Bradhurst. So I'm that, satisfied. That raises a question about. Brad Hurst and the other bidder, um, the totals of alternate recommended, alternate one, 2.1, 2.2, and five. Is it my understanding that, well, just through the math, that we are going to the contract will be for the total plus the alternates? Potentially, depending Potentially. upon where we stand with our uh, costs. Throughout the project. Got yes. It. Okay. I mean, I only ask because of the potential concern that the number two bidder may say, I was with a lower bidder because, you know. Right. We did, we did consult ad nauseum with him. <laughs> <laughs> ad nauseum. Okay. That's <laughs> all, right. uh, all in favor? Uh, Aye. <clears throat> Oppose, abstain, motion carries. All right. We will now move into ongoing business and we have uh, some policies for second reading. Recommended action that the board conducts a second reading and adopts the following board policies as presented. Uh, Neil, we went over these at the last meeting. Did we have any uh, substantive changes 
We had no substantive changes. We had no comments. We had no questions. We had no anything. So right. does guess. anyone have any questions? Uh, well, can I first, can I get a, um, someone to so move? move? Neil, and a second? Second. And on the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? The motion carries. All right. And uh, recommended action the Board of Education conduct a second reading of and rescind policy 2360R, the minutes regulation. So moved. Second. Who is that, Theo? Theo? Yes. Uh, all right. On the question? <clears throat> yeah, I will also say nobody raised any questions or concerns about this item. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Steen? Motion carries. Okay, we will now move into instructional personnel. Uh, be it resolved that the Board of Education, upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, hereby appoints Keith Spengler as 1.0 FTE physics teacher, science tenure area, at the Croton Harmon High School at a salary of $97,757, MA plus 30, step nine. Mr. Spengler is appointed to a four-year probationary term as a physics teacher commencing on August 30, 2023, and the probationary term ending on August 29, 2027 in the tenure area of science. In order to be eligible for appointment to tenure, said teacher must receive at least three APPR ratings of effective or highly effective pursuant to Article 3012D of the Education Law during the four-year probationary term and may not receive an ineffective rating in the final year of probation. Mr. Spangler has initial certification in Physics 7 through 12. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Yeah. On the question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? The motion carries. All right, we will now move into donations. Uh, recommended action that the Board of Education gratefully accepts a donation in the amount of $200 from Neil Haber as a contribution to the Gene Pearl Memorial Fund. So moved. Second. On the question? Yes, I say every year, I just think I should take a moment to let the community know uh, who Gene Pearl was in, and his relationship to our district and our community and the purpose of this memorial award. Gene Pearl was a member of the board for six years, I believe, in the 1960s and returned to the board in the late 90s into the early 2000s, if I remember correctly, or at least in the late 90s. One of his um, passions as a member of the board was to support the students in our transitional alternative program. And Gene um, who passed away probably five, six, eight years ago, um, always attended the when they tap program with Sam Alcapinti and Sue Lewis had the um, uh, annual Thanksgiving dinner. Um, attended the end of the year um, brunch or breakfast for the um, students in the tap program, and he was very passionate about making sure that those students who were not necessarily going to be the college-bound students that we think of were. Um, respected and were celebrated. So the purpose of this award is to honor a student, which doesn't necessarily have to be a senior, but it will be who has overcome adversity and has, as a result of their um, work and efforts in school and, and in the community, um, basically become um, move themselves in a position to see, to succeed in life. And even though Gene um, is no longer with us, and even though the TAP program is being transitioned into the FLEX program and other, so, and other um, programs that we have for students who need those kinds of assistance, um, I am honored to continue to um, support this award, but I will be abstaining because I think I should go on 
Something that I'm doing. Except in your room. Right. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstention. Motion carries. And then move on to our, our next donation. Uh, recommend an action that the Board of Education gratefully accepts a donation in the amount of $1,000 from Croton EMS as a contribution to the Charles A. Ellison Memorial Scholarship at Croton Harmon High School. So moved. Second. On the question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Recommended action that the Board of Education gratefully accepts a donation in the amount of $600 from the American Legion as a contribution to two American Legion awards at Croton Harmon High School. So moved. Second. On the question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. And recommended action that the Board of Education gratefully accepts two $100 donations from Eric Kohler and New York Life as a contribution to the Carrie E. Tompkins Elementary School General Fund. So moved. Second. Um, on the question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. All right. Uh, again, we just wish to uh, thank our donors uh, for taking the time and thinking of our students and supporting um, the many things that are going on in our district. We are very much appreciative. We will now move into the consent agenda. Recommended action that the Board of Education approve all items in the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. On the question. You see that the tennis. Uh, yes. Right. Yes, mm -hmm. I, yes, very excited to see that. Yeah. All right, no questions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. All right, we will now um, move into the close of the meeting um, and into our second uh, hearing of the public. So again, if you would like to speak, we ask that you use the podium and state your name. Please keep your comments to three minutes. Quickly, the economic issues. You're lucky to have an assistant superintendent does so well. But the matter of the electric bus is always astounding. It's an ideological issue. It costs tremendous amounts of money. Each one of your buses costs $300,000 more than an internal combustion engine bus. The length of its service is unknown. And you depreciate an internal combustion bus over 14 years. And now we find out that electric vehicles are more pollutant, given how they make the batteries, et cetera. We don't know that, that how long these batteries will last. They're not going to last as long as in fact. So basically, the three buses that you purchased with, with this purchase is $1 million, plus the electric um, charging station of $25,000. You could hire 10 new teachers, which you hired $65,000. Plus their benefits for the cost of these lousy folks um, instead of paying $100,000 to the generator. So that is a ripoff. We're paying for it somehow at some level, wherever the money comes from. Appreciate Mr. Haber going to the physical security conference, the physical security of these schools, which now have three and a half schools, um, is incredibly important. If you can't keep them safe, you got to go out of business. So we appreciate his attention to the matters. I'd like to bring two things to your attention. There's a sixth grade teacher in the middle school that has a pronoun problem, constantly quizzing kids about their pronouns. This is a grooming technique. It really stinks, and she should knock it off. And you also have a teacher, most radical teachers, seven, per, um, seven out of 10 school teachers in the United States are Democrats or left wing. Nine out of 10 college 
uh, teachers and professors, like Democrats or social. Uh, conservatives like myself, pro-life people have a very difficult road when we deal with organizations like yours. And we're worried about our students and students in general, uh, especially when we see what's coming out of colleges. So when, I, when another sixth grade teacher gives a list of um, young activists, remember uh, Mr. Griffin, going to turn all our students into activists? I know what kind of activists he's talking about. Uh, on our list, they have two abortion activists, sixth grade, their age, 13, 12 year old. <laughs> so here you're asking sixth graders, 12 years old, 13 years old, to write about sixth grade, seventh grade abortion activists who ask if they know what the hell they're talking about at sixth and seventh grade. If we're gonna go down that road, I'm willing to go down that road because I've had 50 years of experience. And we'll start with talking about um, clipping. Thank you. Thank you. We will now uh, move into board reports. Um, we did, uh, do we have any updates from advocacy? We met in March. We did. We met before the last, before right. our last, last meeting. meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nope. and we were just waiting for the governor's budget. Still waiting. Hopefully we'll see that soon. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, board development. Um, we spoke, so um, we had board development meeting on Monday, um, and last week I had actually followed up with um, Patrick Longo, who was our member relations uh, person at NISBA, um, who um, would be more than happy to come down and do a presentation for us um, about uh, basically about board self-evaluations. So if we were looking to schedule it, it, it's not a retreat in that it's not a customized thing, but it is not, um, it would not be for a public meeting. It would just be a presentation on uh, basically on the ways in which the board can go forth and do a self-evaluation. So we'll be looking to um, schedule, get some dates out. So be on the lookout for an email. Uh, for an email from me or Tracy to get some dates on the calendar. We may try to schedule that ahead of a meeting if we could. Um, Mr. Longo tells me it's about a one and a half hour uh, presentation. Um, so we'll see when people are available, but I'd like to, we'd like to get that kind of on the schedule for um, May at, at the late, you know, by mid-May so that we have some time to, to spend to, to do our self-evaluation. Um, and that was the, the crux of our conversation for um, board development. Um, communications, Josh, do you have any yes, communications do. on his absence? Uh, the communications committee met on April the 12th. Uh, we were introduced to Lauren Fontana, who is a new colleague who is working with Jackie Burton on uh, public relations matters. Um, it was noted that the communications committee had not met for a while. Um, and we had a discussion concerning the cadence of meetings. Um, all agreed that there's no when there are when there is no agenda, there should not be a meeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is, there's, there's no reason to have a meeting if there is an, uh, aren't, aren't agenda items. And if agenda items are pro forma, then we need to think about those agenda items, uh, uh, what their usefulness is. And uh, I, I think we came up with a, a, a pretty good plan on when it is appropriate to meet. And, uh, one of the things that we talked about at the time that is appropriate to meet is when there are, uh, for instance, as an example, policy matters uh, or decisions of policy matters or other decisions of the board that require that might require nuance in their communication or a uh, or a. Uh, a communication plan that is specific to them that is different from our usual ways of communicating changes. Um, if it's something that we would just do using the policy corner on the website combined with our minutes, for instance, then it doesn't make sense to have the communication committee necessarily need to use the standard procedure. It's only if the if the if we feel for some reason the procedure needs to be different, different then it might be referred from the board to the communications committee for 
um, analysis. Uh, the other case was that when there are policies or, or policies or changes or decisions of the board that affect how the district communicates, at that point, it doesn't make sense for the communications community to, meet to decide how mm -hmm. to, to go into, to get that from policy and regulation into procedure and to consult on that. Uh, the other topic, uh, the next topic at, at the meeting was budget communications. Um, the good news is that this was a, a relatively short segment of the meeting because we have already got a really good cadence of budget communications already developed, a good calendar and a good process. And uh, the, the one thing that we did decide that we were going to do that we haven't done in a while is to have some kind of a meet the board of ed event on April the 29th um, with That's a, a Saturday. that is a Saturday, I believe, and uh, location to be determined that okay. is uh, not known yet. Um, the idea is to catch not so it would be publicized, but the idea is to catch um, you know casual people who might not seek us out directly by sending an email or coming you know or mm -hmm. to another event, but who happen to be out and about in the community uh, on that day. Okay. Um, and um, we agreed that we would meet next in June to discuss um, any communications concerning the ongoing capital program work. Josh, did you establish a time for the 29th or no? Not yet. No. We did not. All right, so we will be on the lookout for uh, more details there on that. Thank you. Um, that leaves policy. Policy. As uh, Ray said, we met um, a couple of weeks ago. I think it was on the 27th, and we will be meeting again Tuesday, 18th. On that agenda will be, among other things, um, continued discussion of social media policies uh, for the district, not final to report to the board, but discussion is work to be done. Um, <clears throat> discussion of the colloquially calls me playing up, that is um, policies that policy regarding students ability to um, in the middle school, if they are um, athletically um, called superior, uh, to have the opportunity to play on high school teams. Over the years, the board has considered this policy a number of times and has made changes based on um, recommendations from administration and uh, concerns raised by members of the community. And we are going to look at it again. Um, we may also do some more work on the equity and inclusivity policies. I'm not sure if we'll get to that. Other things that we know that we are going to be working on may or may not be at this meeting will be um, policy on eligibility for students to participate in extracurricular and co curricular activities, where we have a current policy that is really not, um, that's not as looked at as 11 years ago. And there are things in that policy um, which, um, are either outdated or not being done. Um, I understand that Student Path to Congress has already looked at that and has some comments. Yes, Josh, you were yeah, I, at I, SFC, I so we'll hear about that. I'll discuss that in polling of the board. Right, and we will hear about that um, and discuss those when we meet on the 18th. Um, hopefully, we will have comments if anybody has them on the two policies that are up for second reading or that we just had mm -hmm. first reading. Before four policies, and we will see what else is on our very lengthy agenda that we have every time that we don't always get through <laughs> and but, you know, uh, every past semester. <clears throat> All right. Uh, well, speaking of polling and board, um, now we'll move into polling. Josh. Uh, item number one uh, is, uh, I've been attending the village bill, uh, the, the village bicycle and pedestrian committee meetings. And uh, my colleagues on the board will note that we have received a 
an email, a letter from Matt Arnold, Arnold, Chair of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Committee, concerning the institution of a off-street bike path connecting CHHS and PVC. This thing has been discussed a few times. Uh, it is a longish letter with illustrations. Um, I refer it to administration mm -hmm. for their uh, discussion with the uh, architects, see whether this is something that we might be able to make some progress on, uh, as it is something that I that that I do think is um, would increase the safety of, for students uh, who bicycle to and from school. Um, next item up, uh, as as Neil mentioned, I did attend the Student Faculty Congress uh, yesterday. Was G Day. Um, and there was discussion of policy 5205, which is the uh, extracurricular, co-curricular, and athletic participation policy. And though I don't remember the exact name of the policy off the top of my head right now, but I do remember the number. Uh, there was extensive discussion. Uh, that was very, um, there were a lot of questions. There were a lot of very good questions. Um, and there was interesting input, which I have uh, took some notes about, which we'll take back to the, to the policy committee. Um, the Student Faculty Congress is continuing to work on that. They have created a shared document that they are using to uh, conduct additional, um, additional internal discussions about the topic and with the idea of getting us uh, feedback um, as promptly as they feel that they can. The other topic that came up at Student Faculty Congress was the status of the stage crew. And uh, uh, a, a group of students from the stage who came to Student Faculty Congress to speak about the, uh, the lack of a permanent advisor for stage crew um, and their desire not just to have an advisor uh, so that the club could actually run uh, but also to have um, that be a person who could actually serve as provide instruction in stagecraft in technical stagecraft, uh, sound, lighting, props, costumes. Uh, I don't know if that costume, um, um, uh, carpentry, etc. Prop building. So there was a lot of interest in that. Um, I believe that they're going to be coming back to the next Student Faculty Congress meeting to speak again. Uh, one of the things that, that they mentioned is that absent an advisor, they cannot work in the auditorium because they cannot work on it un, unsupervised. And that because of this, for some of the recent productions, it became necessary to actually hire someone to build props for the productions. Rather, it makes the pay to have props produced as mm -hmm. opposed to having students be able to produce props and build sets. So there was some concern there about how that could be resolved. And I think that's all I had from SC. Molly, I, I, Molly, I apologize if I just stole your thunder. Mm -hmm. If you had anything else to report <laughs> relative to that. Yeah, no, I'll definitely elaborate a little more on stage crew situation. So we all kind of take stage for granted the PVC musical we were all just talking about. They help with that. They do all the high school shows. They do the concerts. They do like everything that goes on in the auditorium. And I'm friends with a lot of people in stage crew and I've like done the musical myself. So I like really appreciate the work they do, but not everyone sees all the work they do behind the scenes. They have to do all this sound and lighting stuff, things that are really complicated and it takes experience and expertise to be able to do these things well and it's not just having an advisor there present to do the work and that's really important but it's also being able to have someone to teach um teach the people teach the kids in stage group how to do these things um one of the seniors at the meeting was saying that he feels like he's a year behind in what he knows because of the year that they've been without an advisor and that at the beginning of the year they had a bunch of freshmen who were interested in stage crew but they weren't they didn't have anyone to, they didn't have some an advisor to learn from, and they weren't able to be in the auditorium as much as they should be. So most of them just left. So having an advisor, a permanent advisor, is really important 
for with the survival of stage crew and for how well our performances go. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But I see all these. I see all these really big numbers on the board. Personally, um, they like kind of make my head spin. It's like tens of millions of dollars. So, yeah, we should definitely. I think that you know, personally, I don't know how much the advisor of stage crew gets compensated, but they also pointed out that it's a very demanding, time-consuming role. So, it should get a appropriately compensated to make sure that to be a well-being in a program and to respect the time and effort of whatever faculty member does that. Yeah. Yeah, if I may, just I have a recollection that in past years, and that was even a number of years ago, the district utilized advisors for some clubs who were not faculty members when they could not find a faculty members couple that I can think of. I don't know given given the time that stage crew would be working, which basically be after school, whether there might be community members who could serve in that capacity. Um, and whether that they might be I'm thinking of community members who have the knowledge and experience to meet the things that Josh reported had been discussed at Student Country Congress and Molly, the things you discussed. Obviously, there are a bunch of different issues that are raised, but just a thought that I had that might be able to meet, meet the problem and unless and until uh, there's a faculty member who is willing to take on that role at the time, you know, give the time and have the knowledge to be able to yeah, it's just it's just a thought which I I bring up for administration and mm -hmm. then for us to consider. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add um, to what Josh said about the bike path, <laughs> and which is urge administration to also consider um, those options in thinking about accessibility, um, not only for bikes but also for any kind of um, safety for the children. So wheelchairs, even just walking. It's really treacherous to try and leave PVC and go on all cut to go to go into town with friends. Um, you have, you know, and if you're in a, if you're in any any kind of wheels going down the steps that you have to take to get to the town is, is very difficult. Um, you know, impossible. So, and then your your other choice is the road. So, I think a path like this would be great for all the kids to be able to go together into town. So, I would urge you to consider it for that reason too. Josh, yes, the, the bike and pedestrian committee has checked with the town about putting a either a stop sign or some kind of sign on the intersection of Alcott and. That and was the, the problem. There's a couple of problems. Uh, number one, the village has very little control over anything on Maple because it's a state highway. Mm -hmm. um, and getting New York State Department of Transportation to, to do anything is. Very difficult. Um, the 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 bigger concern is really, even if they did, bicycles are not supposed to be on sidewalks, and that's a treacherous, relatively high speed. Even if it's signed at twenty five miles per hour, twenty miles per hour mm -hmm. is too loud. To you know, bicycles are not supposed to be on the sidewalks because that would create other hazards for yeah. other yeah. students who are walking there. So it, it that doesn't really solve the problem, at least for for uh, for for bicyclists, and and it's also the long way around, right? Uh, for many, a couple of things. I think you may you may want to note that the village has before it, and I think the pastor is about to pass a uh, local law that would create. Um, a 25 mile an hour speed limit for all roads in mm -hmm. the village, other than those for which they don't have control, which is the state roads, and also um, Brown Point Avenue will be 30 or 35. So we don't have control of that. I know when I attended village meetings on the discussion on the question of traffic control devices like 
traffic lights at Olcott in, or, or, in order to slow down traffic for pedestrian safety and vehicle safety, we were told by probably the village engineer or somebody that they will not, the state will not approve a traffic light, more traffic lights, because the volume of traffic, whatever it is, is not sufficient to meet that criteria. Um, the one question about that Mary raises, and that, you know, I I am generally in favor of the idea of using that pathway along, you know, creating a pathway <coughs> um, around the baseball field and then down to um, the the way to get to PVC is, um, let me first say that that is the access road, if you will, or access pathway for emergency vehicles to get to the back of PVC. When we developed and the plans for the additions to PVC, one of the questions that was raised was, how will fire trucks get to the back of PVC if there's a fire? And they have to come basically on the track on the side of the baseball field around and go down that yeah. ramp. Yeah. But that's a steep hill. So for wheelchair access, you know, as much as we'd like, that would be very difficult because the the yeah, pitch pretty, is, pretty is pretty such high. that you know you wouldn't be able to get people up or down. And my understanding is, but the architects can speak to this, yeah. is that to develop some kind of a more gentle ramp um, would be very difficult given just kind of what it's like in the back of PVC. Yeah. I know we are talking about and uh, we've approved, voters have approved um, putting uh, some kind of turf on that field, that play field in the back of PVC. Um, I don't know if they can also you know, deal with this question mm -hmm. of, the, of that slope. Other than that, you know, the slope issue, I think for a bicycle, if you wheel your bicycle up the hill, well, you know. there, there's another nuance in this, which is in the uh, uh, in the contact uh, in the text of the letter, which is that uh, there is concern. Uh, there's a safety concern about using the back of the school for bicycle parking and the desire, you know, uh, Principal Plotkin suggested that. I, ideally, bicycle parking should be in the front of the school, not in the back of the school. Uh, that presents an even greater issue because now you've got a, a full story difference mm -hmm. between the back of the school and the front of the school. So th this is something that I think we do need to just re to refer over to the architects and let them see what they can come up with uh, in that regard. The other thing that's, uh, that's somewhat tangentially related to this that did also come up in the Bicycle Pedestrian Committee is the fact that the uh, the village will... Um, is renewing their efforts to enact a complete streets policy, uh, which is a very important thing because you need that because having a complete streets policy um, allows the village to apply for grants uh, to improve that bicycle and pedestrian facilities uh, that they would not be eligible for without the complete streets policy in place. So that is something that is, um, there was work going on on that prior to COVID and it kind of fell by the wayside and it is coming back. And uh, I think there's an intent to try to get that, get a policy in place in the next, I want to say the next six months so that they can apply for grants for the next fiscal year. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, thank you. Um, is that all for you, Joshua? That's all I got. All right, anybody else for polling? No, I have something. Oh, oh so, yeah. you go first. Oh, okay. Um, I just wanted to, I know I already mentioned this in my report, but I just wanted to reiterate again that I really hope to see a lot of people at the Take Back the Night March on sure. Thursday, April 27th. Um, I know it's a really uncomfortable topic, and I'm, but I still, you know, I feel that especially for students, middle school students, I'm not saying like saying bring your six year old to this because it's really intense. It's like you know a heavy subject, but um, yeah, um, kids in middle school they're old enough to learn about these issues because they're old enough to be affected by them. I remember hearing about 
on um, the infamous sexual assault six years ago when I was in sixth grade. I remember where I was. I remember where I was sitting. Um, I remember my friend telling me that someone had gotten rapid at a party. Uh, yeah, she didn't even know how to pronounce the word yet, but we were hearing about it. And I have had friends who in the school district who were affected by these issues at this age. Uh, yeah, so if sixth, seventh graders are old enough to hear about these things, to be affected by these things, to even be the perpetrators and to get pregnant, then they should um, be involved in these kinds of things. So yeah, I really hope to see a lot of people there. Thank you. Yes, what I would say as uh, high school building planning councilman today, we did talk about the year end events and a catalog of everything that's happening for um, seniors between now and the end of the end of the school year, which we don't need to talk about now, but I'm sure come next month. I will say that one of the things that a lot of things will be happening, like the take back tonight event in the Holocaust event in um, <clears throat> the month of April, spring concert, and so on. I guess we know that um, Principal Duback will be starting new jackets after the beginning of May, which is kind of jokingly said, she's trying to get everything, all these things done so like she can be part of them and you know, there won't be anything for her interim to do except <laughs> put his feet up on the desk. <laughs> I know that's not the case. Um, other than that, we talk, continue to talk about the um, SAT, BBT, um, AI, and how that affects, um, affects students, affects learning, affects teaching. The um, high school did a um, survey of students uh, to ask about whether they have used um, different AI um, platforms or programs, how they've used them, what they think about them. And interestingly, do you see using AI as cheating? Why or why not? And there were some very interesting responses that we discussed. And we will then be thinking about next steps um, to kind of figure out exactly how AI can fit in a positive way into high school teaching and learning. I know we had a board presentation back in the fall about it, but it was one of the things that was said is from next September, the whole universe may be very different than even it is today. So that's, that was our discussion. Anyone else have anything for Paul? All right, then uh, we will now then move into uh, items needed for the next Board of Education meeting. So our next meeting will be on April 25th. That is the GOCES budget vote. Um, it is also traditionally um, the time that we do a code conduct review um, pending uh, the policy meeting. Uh, I don't think that we have necessarily substantive changes to the code of conduct this year. Um, but also what uh, we would like to, since uh, that sort of frees up maybe a little bit of time for us to uh, delve into some other items for work session, um, we would be looking at um, looking at another of our guiding questions, and that is the uh, the first, the how will Croton Harmon develop into a future-driven school system, um, and hearing from our um, full, full administrative, administrative council. Um, on some things that are going on there, um, particularly related to uh, some of the new hiring practices. So, um, if anyone has any questions or, or you know things they they have with re with regard to sort of that guiding question um, that you would like our administration to explore as they put together um, some topics for us for that night, let let us know. Um, with that that will be it. Um, and then following that, our, like I said, our May 4th meeting will be the public uh, budget hearing. All right. No one has any questions or anything else. Uh, recommended action that the Board of Education adjourns this meeting at 9.25 p.m.
So moved. Second. I'm sorry, who was it first? Uh, Omar. Omar and Josh seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. All right. Thank you very much. And have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.